Turn with me in your Bibles, please, in the Old Testament. In fact, the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis and chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, commencing from verse 22. And he, that is Jacob, arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. You know, God will bless the reading of his precious word. You may be here today and think, it's a strange story, but it's just as inspired as John 3 and 16. And we see in our reading from verses 22, 23, beginning of verse 24, this experience must have been a very important event in the history of man's redemption. Jacob, whom God had chosen, was to be the father of the children of Israel, through whom God himself would finally come into the world, not only in the form of man, but as the very son of man. And here at this point, Jacob was facing the greatest opposition to the accomplishment of God's divinely ordered mission. Here in Genesis chapter 32, we find Jacob in a crisis. Ever been in a crisis? Here's a crisis. Jacob has arrived at a crossroads in his life. Do you know why? Because his past has caught up with him. He is about to meet his elder twin brother, Esau. Esau, who had been his enemy ever since, many years before, Jacob had taken away Esau's birthright for a bowl of stew and had stolen Esau's official blessing by their father Isaac, and Jacob did it all through complete deceit. So now you can understand his past had caught up with him. Esau is coming with 400 men. Did you hear that? Esau is coming with 400 hundred men. And Jacob, for good reason, fears for his life and sends 
all his family and all his possessions on ahead before him across the river. Here's something important to note. If Esau were to be victorious here, all of God's plans and promises would be defeated. And all the world would never have a Savior. There's the situation. Then we find at the start of verse 24, after he'd sent his family on ahead, after he sent all his possessions on ahead, we read in verse 24, then Jacob was left alone. I wonder if you've ever been in that position or if you're not in that position right now. Jacob was left alone. He was isolated. He was alone. He was unprotected. He was utterly helpless out in the open. But you know what? That's exactly what God wanted. Remember that, friends. You might think, well, I feel so isolated at the moment. I feel alone. I don't know what to do. And I feel I'm all by myself. And I feel helpless. Have you thought of it, child of God? Maybe that's exactly where the Lord wants you to be. And he needs you to be for what he wants to do in your life. Jacob was left alone. You see, God cannot meet with you or us as God's people when we are too busy with the affairs of this life. You see, this is where God wants us at times, all alone, helpless, isolated, so that we are totally helpless and we have to depend on Him alone. We have no choice. Sometimes the Lord and His grace and mercy slowly moves us over to boxes in a situation where we have to cry out to God for help. And God cannot meet with us when we're too busy with the affairs of this life, when we are distracted, when we are taken up with ourselves, when we're taken up with other people, when we're taken up with possessions. Very often the Lord has to get us into a position where we are all alone. That's what we need to be at times. And we're going to look at a number of things regarding Jacob. What we see here in the scriptures today, first of all, we see here Jacob's confrontation. We see it here from the latter part of verse 24 and verse 25. Jacob's confrontation. Notice what it says. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day, until the dawn. A man wrestled with Jacob until the breaking of day. Now, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, hold on, who was this man? In some modern translations, you'll have a clue because man is in with a capital M, gives you a clue. Who was this man? In fact, the prophecy of Hosea in chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, lets us into this, unlocks the whole thing. It says in Hosea 12, verses 3 and 4, that he, Jacob, took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength, he, Jacob, struggled with God. Yes, Jacob struggled with the angel and prevailed. Jacob wept and sought favor from him. He struggled with the angel. Notice it does not say he struggled with a angel. The angel. Friends, this was the angel of the Lord. This was none other than the Lord himself. What is termed as the pre-incarnate Son of God. Before God became flesh and was born into the world, the Son of God, this is the Son of God before he came into the world. 
in flesh. The angel of the Lord. We know him as Jesus the Christ because he took on human flesh. But here he is, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, the angel of the Lord. This is what is termed a theophany. It is a revealing of God himself. Not a representation, not an envy on behalf of, but this was God himself. This was God the Son. If you recall in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13, 14, and 15, when you have Joshua was pacing back and forward and calling the Lord what to do, didn't what to do before they, they wanted to conquer the city of Jericho. The Bible says that he turned and there was a, there was a mighty man standing in front of him. Gideon's, Sorry, Joshua said to him, are you for us or for them? Here's the answer. Neither. I've come as the commander of the armies of the Lord. Didn't expect that answer, Joshua. So this supernatural man in Joshua chapter 5, who was the commander of the army of the Lord, what happened? Joshua immediately fell down and worshipped him. And Joshua was told to remove his sandals. Two things quickly. Joshua fell down and worshipped him. If this hadn't been the Lord, as John did twice in Revelation towards the end of the, the prophecy, was a mighty angel and, jo and John fell down to worship him, the angel said, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm no more important than you. Worship God. And so when Joshua fell down and worshipped this, this person, there was no contradiction. It was the Lord himself. And the person received the worship because it was the Lord. But notice also, Joshua was told to remove his sandals. Why? Because it was holy ground. Not because any particular tribe or nation or people or saint or religious leader said, excuse me, can't go over there. That's religious ground. Can't go on it. The only reason why it was, it was, it was holy ground, because the Lord himself was there. That's the only reason. You and I, let me tell you something, no individual in the entire world can say, a piece of ground is holy because they say so. A piece of ground is only holy when God's presence comes down. He's the one that makes it holy. Think of Judges chapter 6. Think of Gideon and the angel of the Lord. When the Bible tells us this mysterious person comes to visit Gideon when he's at the threshing floor, he's working hard. And he speaks to Gideon. There's a conversation. The Bible tells us in verse 22, now Gideon perceived that he, this man, was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, because I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He knew who it was. Think of Manoah and his wife. Not Noah, Manoah and his wife, who were to be the parents of Samson. And the angel of the Lord in Judges chapter 13. We read from verse 17. Because this, again, this mysterious person turned up and revealed himself to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful?
That sounds familiar. Isaiah 9 and 6. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Think of Daniel chapter 3. Think of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their heathen names. Cast into the midst, bound, tied up, thrown into the midst of the incredible fiery furnace. Think of that fourth man that appeared with them in the furnace. In the midst of literal fiery trial. And King Nebuchadnezzar, who they reckon was the most powerful potentate, the most powerful sovereign who ever lived on the face of the earth. He just had to move his eyes and your head was taken from your shoulders. Nebuchadnezzar says this, observing the situation. He said, look, Nebuchadnezzar answered, I see four men loose. I thought I only th threw three men in, but I see four men loose walking in the midst of of the fire, and they are not hurt, they are not harmed, and the form of the fourth person is like the Son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar did not know it was the Son of God, but one thing's for sure, Nebuchadnezzar knew that this was beyond him. Nebuchadnezzar knew this was something divine, this was something supernatural, he knew this was way beyond his power, that's why he said, he's like the form of the form is like the Son of God. That was a revelation to Nebuchadnezzar. But back to Jacob. Jacob's confrontation. And a man wrestled with Jacob until the breaking of dawn. With Jacob, it was literally a time of real Struggling. It was a physical, it was a struggle. It was real in every sense of the physical term. Jacob wrestled with the Lord until dawn. All night. All night he wrestled with the Lord. If you wrestle for five minutes, that's tiring. Can you imagine wrestling with someone? But not only that, to wrestle with the Lord. All night until dawn. A man wrestled with Jacob until the breaking of day. Now when he, the Lord, saw that he, the Lord, did not prevail against Jacob, the Lord touched the socket of Jacob's hip. The word touch there means literally the Lord struck the socket of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as the Lord wrestled with Jacob. Notice that. It's important to remember, friends, that something here. The Lord allows Jacob to prevail with him. Got to remember that. The Lord could simply have just very gently gone, that wasn't done. <laughs> he allowed Jacob to prevail with him. Again, according to Isaiah 12 and 4, in Jacob's strength, Jacob struggled with God. The Lord allowed that. So the Lord allows Jacob to prevail over him, though the Lord cripples Jacob in one leg. He cripples Jacob in one leg for two reasons. First of all, to remind Jacob that the Lord is allowing Jacob to prevail. That's the first thing. In other words, at any time, I could do with you what I want to do. But I'm allowing this. Secondly, he did it, the Lord did this, to see how Jacob reacts. Here was the amazing thing. Even though the Lord struck his leg, a socket of his thigh, the Bible tells us Jacob would not let it interfere with his wrestling. 
Did you see that? Jacob kept wrestling with a firm grip. He kept holding on. He kept gripping this man. Even though now he'd a dislocated leg and hip. We see Jacob's confrontation. But then secondly, we see Jacob's conversation. Verse 26. And he, the Lord, said to Jacob, Let me go, because the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Here's Jacob's conversation. Lord says, Let me go. Talk about the grace and mercy of the Lord there. Let me go. The one who could move at any point. This was all part of God's plan, friends. Let me go, said the Lord. But Jacob refuses to give up. I will not let you go unless. Lord, I'm setting a condition here. I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Why do you think Jacob was doing this? And why did he say that? Jacob was desperate. Remember that. But Jacob refuses to give up two things. Firstly, Jacob recognized his superior because the greater always blesses the lesser. So Jacob knew this person was greater than he was. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So Jacob recognized right away, you're greater than I am. So I'm not going to let you go. While I've got you, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. The second thing was this. Jacob's persist persistence. He said, I will not. He just didn't give up quickly. Oh, okay, okay, sorry to, sorry to hold you back. No. I will not let you go unless. I'll let you go if you do. Unless. Jacob held on all the more. He held on tighter. And he would not let go. Friends, God in his grace and mercy allows Jacob to hold on to him. And I think too, I think the Lord enjoyed Jacob holding on to him. You see, the Lord's got us. But he wants us to draw near to him so that we'll hold on to him as he holds on to us. That's the Savior that we serve, friends. He loves us. Doesn't the Bible say underneath there is everlasting arms? In particular, one of our lectures at Bible College back in the 70s, I always remember him saying this. He was a senior pastor at that point, great man of God. And he referred to this scripture from Deuteronomy. Underneath are the everlasting arms. He said, always remember this. You youngins, always remember, you can never get lower than the arms of God. Isn't that wonderful? You can never get lower than the arms of God. His arms are always there to hold us. God in his grace and mercy allows Jacob to hold on to him, seeing that Jacob's faith and understanding were growing as Jacob gripped tightly and closely. The longer that Jacob held on, Jacob was getting stronger spiritually. His faith was growing. Why? Because he was with the Lord. He was holding on to the Lord. You've got to remember this, friends. Jacob, he was not 
the type of person that kind of gives up at the last hur- at the first hurdle. Jacob was determined. He was determined because he was desperate. And brothers and sisters, when you're desperate, let's be honest, we'll try and do anything if we're desperate. But the sad thing is, when we're desperate, who's the last person we go to at times? It's the Lord. I'll do this all by myself. I'm strong enough to cope. I can do it. Friends, the Lord should be the first person that we run to. Remember what the scripture says in Proverbs, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be practicing. And Jacob was determined because he was desperate. He was he was compassionate. He was, as it were, his face was like a flint. He was knew exactly what he wanted, and he wasn't going to be budged from it. Jacob really did need God to bless him at this time in his life. Because at any moment, Esau could come over the hill with 400 men, and that's Jacob's life gone. He's done. Jacob insisted on first being blessed. In spite of a dislocated thigh, Jacob refused point blank to let the Lord go. Refused point blank to let the Lord go. And friends, there's times we need to be like Jacob. Say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. And Lord, I'm not going to draw near to you anymore, Lord, because it seems every time I get into your presence, something happens. Jacob, dislocated thigh. Oh, it can't be God's will for me to be drawing it. I'll back off. Something goes wrong, it must be God's will for me to try and get closer to the Lord. That's what we think with our natural, finite minds. We get the idea of something bad happens. Oh, that can never We think it's a bad thing, but we can never interpret it as being, maybe that's the Lord working something for my good. No, it can't be that. The Lord wouldn't do that. That's right. His mind's greater than our minds. How would we know? Jacob refused, point blank, to let the Lord go. Here's what we need to remember, friends. This is what Part of the crux of this whole story is Jacob's wrestling with the Lord. Do you know what it involved? Agonizing prayer. That's what it involved. Agonizing prayer. You don't think that Jacob just said once to the Lord, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. No, from the moment the Lord said that to him, he said, let me go because the days are but I'm not. From then on, all the time he kept struggling. He says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. I'm not letting you go. It would have been like a, used to say years ago, the needle was stuck in the record. Remember that? For those who know what a, remember what a record player is. And Jacob would have kept, I will not let you go unless you bless. I will not let you go. I will not let you go unless you bless me. It was agonizing prayer that was involved here. According to the scripture we looked at earlier on, Hosea chapter 12, verse 4, we see that it involved weeping and supplication. That's what it says. Weeping and supplication, as well as physically holding on. So Jacob was wrestling. He was praying. He was agonizing in his prayer. It involved tears. He was weeping. He was crying. It involved supplication, pleading with the Lord, saying, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. I'll not let you go unless you bless me. In fact, Hosea 12 and 4 says, Yes, Jacob struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept. Jacob wept and sought favor from him. That means he made supplication too. Jacob petitioned the Lord, and he would not let the Lord go unless you bless me. There used to be an old saying 
and I'm saying many years ago, long before me, long before you, in evangelical circles. They talk about getting to grips with God. Do you know what that meant? Prayer. Been like that for decades and decades, even more than a century. They've talked about getting to grips with God, and it comes from here. Genesis 32. Getting to grips with God. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Notice again verse 24 of our reading. Then Jacob was left alone. There are times, brothers and sisters in Christ, there are times when we must deliberately, when we must plan to get alone with God. In our experience, and know exactly what we should persist in. Because then, it's only when we do that, then we will learn where not to waste our energies. We get the idea, oh, this is how the Lord would want it, and we pour our energy into this area, or to that area, and the Lord's going, what? Whereas we would save ourselves a lot of heartache and headaches. We simply go to the Lord first. Say, Lord, you show me. And then the Lord will reveal it. And then all will begin to come in to the picture. Then we begin to understand what's really happening. We must persist in that. We must be persistent in what is termed again, another old term, travailing in prayer. Travailing in prayer. I haven't heard that phrase for many, many years. Many years. Travailing in prayer. Now, Jesus, when he talks to the disciples in the upper room in John's gospel, before he goes out to be betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he speaks about joy. And he says about a woman who gives, who's having a child. She, says she travails before the birth. She travails with pain. And she's travailing and travailing. But once the baby is born, once she gives birth, she no longer remembers or thinks about the travailing and, and pain. Because now the baby is born. Joy comes in. And now her attention is all on the baby. And friends, we need to realize that too. We need to realize that when we travail in prayer. And then when the answer comes, then we'll have that wonderful, tremendous blessing of the Lord. And then all that travailing in prayer, which was not easy, at times agonizing, and times with weeping and tears. We forget that because now the Lord's answered. Now on to the next thing. You see, friends, here's what it's about. It's about paying the price. If we want the, answer, the Lord to meet our needs, and we're not seeing a breakthrough, it requires paying the price. It requires counting the cost. The Lord is looking at us saying, how desperate are you? How desperate are you? How much do you really want me to bless you? How much do you really want me to, to help you in this situation? And friends, we must be persistent in getting to grips with God and not letting go until you have received your help and received your blessing from the Lord. There's a scripture in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 32, and we read this from verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. 
Then Moses pleaded. Mo Moses made supplication with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, ha, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Jacob. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I, have, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. The lovely thing about this is as the Lord also wanted to see, to hear from Moses, his response. Moses did not go that way, because the Lord knows all things. Moses did not say, yeah, Lord, wipe them out from the face of the earth, and I'm the only one left, and all your promises can then come through me. No. It didn't work like that. God knows everything. He knows beginning to the end. And so, Notice that. What did, what did the Lord say to Moses? Moses, let me alone, just like to Jacob. Leave me alone. Let me alone that I may consume them. But Moses would not leave God alone. He would not let him alone. Moses pleaded with the Lord for the people. Moses made supplication and reminded God of his divine plan and promises. And as a result, as a result, the Lord relented because Moses was persistent. Just like Jacob, Moses was persistent. And friends, sometimes real persistence and supplication is needed in order to receive an answer from God. We live in an age where everything at times is too easy. We get it too easy. We touch our iPhone, it's instant. We, we, we phone up Instant. We expect it now. We expect things yesterday. Everything is instant today with the internet, with social media. Everything is instant. But there's times, friends, we need real persistence. And we need real supplication in order to receive an answer from the Lord. Romans 12 and 12 states to the believers, speaks of continuing steadfastly in prayer. Colossians 4 verse 2 instructs, continue earnestly in prayer. Notice those two phrases, two different books in the New Testament, Romans and Colossians. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, continue earnestly in prayer, in both verses, it's the same Greek word. Earnestly and steadfastly, it's exactly the same Greek word. The word of God is telling us, let's keep being persistent. Let's keep at it, steadfastly, earnestly. And the Lord said, let me go, because the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And here it is. Jacob, how can we describe him? Jacob is the man who would not let God go. He would not let God go. And brothers and sisters, don't let God go. I'm not talking about salvation here. Because half the time we don't, if that was the case, half the time we wouldn't be saved. There's times, many of the times I don't feel saved. I'm so glad salvation is not according to my feelings. Because I'd be lost there and then, right away. So this is nothing to do with salvation. This is to do with our walk with the Lord, our relationship. Like Jacob. Let's be people who will not let God go. And we're going to leave it there today. And we're going to pick up the latter part next week and see what the Lord has for us. But Jacob was the one who would not let God go. 
And friends, between now and next Sunday, get prepared. Get prepared between now and then and start to pray. Start to ask the Lord. Start to call on the Lord. And start to say, Lord, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. You don't have to wait till next Sunday until you get blessed. He can bless you at home. He can bless you wherever you are. But if you want to see things building up, you want to see the Spirit of God working in next Sunday service, then we've got to pray about it. It's not just a case, well, the Lord's going to be here. He'll just do what he wants. No, no, no. We have an influence in that. We have part of that to play because the Lord says, well, you know, it's what, it's what you want. It's only what, if you want me to be there, I'll be there, but I'm not going to do anything unless you want it. And that's apart from sovereign moves of God. Very often, we can ask the Lord, say, Lord, please, please undertake, Lord. So between now and next Sunday, when you come next Sunday, last Sunday morning service, there was many people who were prayed for last Sunday. And, I, and I'm waiting to hear testimonies. And, and if you feel nothing's happened yet, please don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Because the Lord is still working. Don't let go. Keep calling out to the Lord. Lord, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. Lord, I'll not let you go until, Lord, you heal me in this situation. Lord, until you answer this prayer next week, we're going to see what the Lord is going to work in our lives, the answers to our needs. And to Jesus be all the glory. Amen? Amen. Thank you for listening so well.